So now that we've understood who Charles Darwin was, what he observed, and what he inferred based off of his observations, let's continue and complete our discussion on Charles Darwin by really understanding what natural selection, those two words, are all about in this next flowchart entitled Charles Darwin Roman numeral 1, 2, 3. Okay, so let's continue our discussion. Let's go right back into it. So, how does natural selection play a role in this idea of overproduction? This is a critical thing to understand. Many students don't realize the importance of this until they get an understanding of what natural selection does in terms of that overproduction. Overproduction, what was that? What was that? Uh, what did Darwin do with that? Overproduction was his observation, and off of that observation, he came up with those two inferences. So let's see how natural selection plays a role. So the key idea behind this is to understand a predecessor of Mr. Charles Darwin. We have to understand that Darwin actually based this idea off of a very crucial um, uh, man of the time. He actually based off of uh, a man by the name of Thomas Malthus. He was a reverend, actually. So again, the big theme, the big sort of style of scientist was to be a natural theologist. And this man was that. So this was based off of uh, Reverend Thomas Malthus' work. Okay, so what did Reverend Thomas Malthus say? Well, Thomas Malthus, on besides being a reverend, he was actually also an economist. Okay, he was a really, really important economist that studied something known as human population growth. And he studied human population growth, and he also, with that, studied something known as food population growth. Let me actually put that a little bit higher. I want to make this exactly right next to it for a purpose. Food population growth. So he studied how the human population grows. He studied how the food population that the humans eat grows, and he came up with this idea. He stated that human population growth increases geometrically. So we'll say it increases geometrically. What does that mean? Okay, well, before I explain what that means, let me just tell you how food population grows. Food population increases arithmetically. Okay, so we're going to write that down. Increases arithmetically arithmetically. I'm just trying to squeeze these letters in. So, geometrically, arithmetically. What does that mean? Basic idea behind this is the following. So let me give you a geometric sequence. A geometric sequence would be the increase of human population growth would go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8. What's next? To 16. Okay, let me give you the opposite. Not the opposite, but a different variation of increase. This would be arithmetic in that it is 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. Notice the difference. Which one is growing at a faster rate? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. This is geometric growth. This is arithmetic growth. So, big deal. Why do we care about this? Well, Thomas Malthus, based off of this idea, he said, you know what? This is actually interesting because... The natural resources of Earth, and this is something we know today, but remember, Malthus did this over 150 years ago. The natural resources on Earth are actually rather limited. Think of overproduction. Natural resources are limited, okay? And because of this limitedness, this limitation, let's say, of natural resources, there is an inherent subsequent competition, actually. There's a true competition that's going to be there for those exact limited resources. Because if something's limited, you're going to have to compete for that. And this competition, combined with limitation, is a crucial idea behind natural selection and overproduction. Now, remember, when I say natural resources, you have to think of them like this. Natural resources are in things like food, habitat, mates, hiding places, anything that's natural that is needed for survival is a natural resource and there's a competition for environment, there's a competition for um, let's say territory, food, all those things that I mentioned. 
So this is all Thomas Malthus. Where does Darwin come into this? Well, Darwin comes into this because of this idea of overproduction. What Darwin believed, based off of what he read in terms of Thomas Malthus, is something that we've already stated. More individuals are in an environment, uh, more individuals in environment that can possibly be supported, that can be supported. So there is an unequalness. The environment cannot support every single person. And that means that because the environment cannot support every single person, not all individuals will survive and reproduce. This is critical right here. Not all individuals survive and reproduce. Because not all individuals are surviving and reproducing, we have limitations. There are actually other limits I want to mention, um, just because they are also in your notes. Besides the limits to natural resources, there are also things that are causing individuals to not survive and reproduce, like predation. Okay, being eaten, that's simply what predation means. Um, there's also things like diseases, just dying because of disease. And there are also things um, like abiotic factors, things that aren't living, that are causing a struggle for individuals and thus causing some individuals to survive and some individuals not to survive. Some individuals reproduce and some individuals don't reproduce. When I say abiotic factors, I mean like weather. There's a storm that kills somebody. Um, there's a light. You get struck by lightning. Those are all abiotic factors, non-living factors. So, said a lot here. What do I mean by natural selection and overproduction? The theme based off of Thomas Malthus, based off of what Darwin believed, is simply that the struggle of life is real indeed. The struggle is real in life. This is what we mean by natural selection and overproduction. There is a struggle because every individual has the capacity to reproduce but they won't because natural resources are limited, because there's competition, because they might get eaten, they might die, they might get struck by lightning and thus not everybody will survive and reproduce. What does natural selection have to say about that? Let me tell you right over here. So, natural selection. Let's formally define and understand this critical mechanism of evolution. First and foremost, make sure you write that down. This is the mechanism for evolution. This is how evolution happens. Okay, The mechanism for cell respiration, remember cell respiration all the way, way back when, is through what? It's through glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain. That's a mechanism. Well, the mechanism to evolve is to evolve through natural selection. What does natural selection state? It states the following. Better adapted, that's the key word here, better adapted individuals, IND, are more likely, more likely to do what? What are the two, two things every individual wants to do in life? More likely to S plus R survive and reproduce. Better adapted individuals, those who have the best variation, are more likely to survive and reproduce. This is the idea and term that you've heard actually quite wrongly for many, many years of survival of the fittest. Now, I want to make something very clear, something that exams always like to ask. Fitness or being fit, the survival of the fittest, is not about being the strongest, the fastest, the smartest. Fitness is defined as the following, and do not ever forget this. This is something everybody, everybody who uh, learns biology, who says this phrase, says it wrong. Because fitness is not about being strong. It's not about being smart or anything like that. Fitness is simply equal to the ability to have offspring. To have offspring. The most Fit individual, thus, the survival of the fittest means that the individual who will make offspring, who will give offspring, who will pass on their genes is the fittest. So the classic exam question that always happens is like, which one of these is the fittest individual? A tiger who has shown the fastest ability to run and the strongest muscles, um, a tiger that has one child, or an older tiger that has three children and those children have their own children. That tiger, because of the ability to have offspring that's seen, it had three children versus the one that didn't have any children versus the one that had only one child, that tiger is the fittest. 
Be aware that fitness is not about the strongest, the smartest, the fastest. It's about who has the most offspring. The survival of the fittest states that the individual who is the best adapted, whatever that ad adaptation may be, will produce and survive the most offspring. That is what fitness is all about. So please, please don't get that wrong on the exam. It's always a question. Um, the survival of the fittest is how many offspring you have. You are the most fit if you have the most offspring. So sort of a uh, side note. We sort of uh, got on a bit of a tangent there. I just hate when people say that the survival of the fittest is about being the strongest. It's not. It's about how much offspring you can have. And finally, we can say that over here, as a result, as a result of what? As a result of the better adaptations, as a result of the survival of the fittest, what do we see in, in life? What we see is that populations changes over time, so those who are the best and fittest, those who pass on their good genes the most, um, change populations over time. And remember, this is populations, not individuals, and then we have evolution. A uh, key thing you have to understand is that evolution happens at populations, in populations over a long period of time. Evolution does not happen on one organism. That is not true. A population evolves over time. That's what evolution is. And what we state is, this during this evolution, what we state is that the frequency of favorable traits, what do you think happens to the frequency of favorable traits? Frequency of favorable traits, if there's evolution happening, and evolution states that the better adapted individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce, the frequency of favorable traits will inevitably and surely increase because evolution works by natural selection. And natural selection says the better adapted individuals are more likely to reproduce. Thus, the favorable traits will increase. Well, then the other side of the story would be that the frequency of less favorable traits, natural selection, will natural selection select these individuals? No. Naturally, the natural selection will select favorable traits and they will increase in the population over time and thus evolve. The frequency of less favorable traits will inevitably decrease because natural selection will not select them. That's what natural selection is all about. And again, one last thing that people always fail to remember is that this happens over a long time, long time. You cannot see this happen through one generation most of the time. You can, for the purposes of this course, this happens over a long time. And after a long time, organisms become uh, better adapted because of the time, because of the populations that are changing to the environment. This is literally the idea of life itself. Getting adapted to your environment, getting better adapted to your environment through natural selection and thus over time in the population you will see evolution. That is Charles Darwin and his belief in a nutshell. This is the idea of natural selection and how it makes evolution happen. We'll continue our look at Darwinian evolution as we move forward in this series.